introduction. Take one. Hello darlings, I'm Charlize, the founder of online storytelling platform Girls Will Be Boys and this is Say It With Your Chest, a podcast which aims to shine light on the corners of important conversations which are so often missed out of the media or seen as taboo. This Girls Will Be Boys podcast offers you an opportunity to enter different people's worlds, share unfiltered conversations and encourage our guests to say it with their chest. There were times where I would meet up with someone and they would be like, oh, you're a lot bigger in real life. Like, they would say it to me and I'm like, but you knew this. And like, the run up to us meeting, I kept having to remind you, oh, by the way, I'm fat. You're still subscribing to the sexualized sort of right. curvy shape as opposed to just having curvy bodies of all shapes and sizes. Because he's mixed race there was an element of, oh my gosh, Steph, he's so attractive. How did you get him? Today's episode is with the wonderful Steph. Would you like to introduce yourself? Hello. Uh, thank you so much for having me. My name is Stephanie Yaboa and I am an author, freelance journalist, content creator, podcast host, and just someone online that just talks a lot about things. Oh, I feel you. <laughs> I'm literally the same. Like when you reel off a list of things and you're like, actually, I just chat shit online basically, about things that I care about. Yeah. It's the best way forward. <laughs> yeah, basically. Well, you're incredible at everything that you do. I, you. I literally, especially your book, I said, I really struggle to read. Soon as that came in the post, I was like, right, page is done. It was so good. Oh, it was thank so you so good. much. I think when like you have a connection to someone, then it's a lot easier to get into their story. But anyways, we can get into that later. Yes. So I just want to start off, what are your pronouns and what do you identify as gender wise? So my pronouns are she, her. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Same for me. Well, she, her, she, they. Mm -hmm. So today's episode, you know I've been wanting to talk to you for a long, long time. A long time coming. It really is. We're going to talk about the wonderful world of desirability politics. <sighs> long sigh. <laughs> Exasperated sigh. Literally. There's a lot. There's a lot. There really is a lot. I'm going to get straight into it. So when was the first time you feel like you were made aware of desirability politics? I think the first time I was made aware of that was probably... <laughs> When I was eight, um, was it no? Was it, was it when I was eight? No, when I was six. Oh my god! It's a very old memory, but it really stuck in my brain because I remember it was Valentine's Day, and I was in primary school, and there was this guy that I really liked called Zach. I don't care about baiting him out. I don't really care. <laughs> like I still have beef because of that my day. Gosh. And I remember I was really into arts and craft at the time. So I made that this really lovely Valentine's Day card and like put hearts and glitter and all of that kind of stuff. It was amazing. Anyway, on the day I went into, <laughs> I went to second, so sorry, to primary school and I, and I gave it to him. Mm. And I probably made the mistake of giving it to him in front of his friends while his friends were there. Oh. And he opened the card, he read it, he tore it in two, <gasps> he stepped on it and he was like, I never want to go out with you, you fat pig. And I was <gasps> like, okay, this is what heartbreak feels like. I just felt my heart just like break in two in my chest. Wow. And I was like, wow. So that I think that was the first time that I was like, why is this person using my physicality as a means to insult me? And so that was, I think the first time that I really started to associate fatness with like negativity because mm. not only did he kind of make a dig at that, moving forward as I went into secondary school, I started like the majority of my bullying was to do with my weight and how undesirable I was or would be because of that. Mm. And so, yeah, it was a really young age that it started. Well, I feel like when you have the added layers of like marginalization, mm. it's just, where do you go from there? Especially when the experience starts from such a young age. Because especially I feel like desirabilities, well, dating, personally for me, it's like a dark skinned black woman. I feel like it's the hardest thing to navigate with desirability politics. Like, Absolutely. I mean, obviously I wifey up now, but like my experience in the past. So the fact that it actually started with a dating situation with you at that age, mm. where, where, do you, where do you go from there? How, when were you able to put a label on the fact that this is to do with desirability politics? I think it was 
when I was in secondary school. So that was where, you know, we were all um, sort of blooming into teenagers. People were starting to go out, like each other, have, you know, their first kisses and all of that kind of stuff. And I just remember always being like the one looking at everybody else, you know, coupling up and getting into relationships. And I was such a late bloomer and it just felt like everybody around me was being coupled up. And so at the time, back then, it was trendy to be with girls that were light-skinned mm -hmm. or lighties. It, oh, even that <laughs> phrase, like, and it was just the cool thing to be with light-skinned girls. And so being fat and dark-skinned, it really got to me to the point where I actually started like bleaching my skin because wow. I was like, well, I'm plus size and I'm dark, but which one can I perhaps eradicate more? Which mm. one will make the bullying perhaps a bit worse, which one would be quicker for me to eradicate so that I could be a bit more desirable. And at the time, I wasn't looking to go to the gym, like to do PE and all of that kind of stuff. I was like, no, I can't, I'm not. <laughs> so, <laughs> I, don't, I don't have the will know from me. <laughs> to do it at all. And because I used to get like bullied in PE and stuff, so I was like, I'm not doing that. So there was like a local corner shop near my area, like a hair and beauty shop, and they sold um, bleaching creams that had like mercury and stuff in it, like the real bad stuff. And so as a like, a, I think I was, when did I start? 14, I would go to buy the creams. It would be under the table type stuff. So he would have to like take it out, set, he would sell it to me. And then I started bleaching for like a year until it got to the point where my skin was starting to have a really bad effect with it. So like my skin started to go, I wasn't like the caramel colored that I thought I would have. No, it was looking like, yeah, it was like gray and like marble. It was just not cool. Like my skin was having a really bad reaction to it. Mm. And I just wasn't going like turning the color that I thought I needed to be. And mm. so I stopped doing it. And over time, cause when you, cause with skin bleach and it's something you have to do forever, like to yeah. maintain as much, as long as you want to be lighted. So after about a year I stopped. And then over the course of like three to six months, my skin color slowly returned to normal. So it wasn't like a huge change, but the change that I could see, I could tell it was going down a dark path. And it was mm. at that point where I was like, that was when it was cemented in my head through school and through media as well was that being light is the key to being desirable. Cause even in school, like there were other plus size girls in school, but they were mixed race and they mm. never got bullied, like never. They were like very popular and you know, all of that kind of stuff. So that was when I kind of like associated perhaps my darkness with, oh, maybe this is what makes me like super undesirable or ugly or whatever, so. How did your family react to you skin bleaching? Were they aware of like? They weren't aware. Cause like coming from like Ghana, it's such a common thing. So growing up, I would see these creams in my mum's, like in the bathroom, she would have it in, you know, she didn't bleach, but she would, if she got like a scar or like a, a dark mark or hyperpigmentation, mm -hmm. she would use it just to fade that area right. so that it would even out. We were so used to seeing it in the household and I don't even think, yeah, she never questioned me on it. So I don't even think, she noticed, my dad didn't notice, so. Did you ever talk to them about how you felt about the color of your skin? No, I didn't tell my parents anything about how I felt in myself emotionally. Again, they weren't really the most emotionally open parents. So mm. I didn't really talk to them about stuff concerning me until I was in like my mid twenties. So I kind of just like, just kept everything inside <laughs> and just oh kind of dealt with it. Yeah. yeah. No, I can understand that, especially when you feel like with parents or like grandparents, there's certain things that they just don't understand. Like mm. I've tried to have conversations or even if I just mention like to my nan that I'm in therapy, she's like, what do you need therapy for? And it's like, yeah. I can understand where there's that like separation generation wise and feeling like you, you can't actually, even though they're in the same position of like, I'm in the same skin color, you can't actually like talk to them about it because they won't see it as the issue that yeah, they just get on with it, don't they? That's, yeah. that's all they that's all they've had to do is like just keep calm and move on type yeah. thing. So yeah, they don't understand that there are there are actually ways that you can help yourself mm -hmm. mental health wise. So when do you feel like in terms of dating, mm. when did you start dating mm. and how was it navigating that being aware <laughs> of your first experience of dating? When did I start? Um I want to say when I was maybe 23. Mm -hmm. So I was late, I was a late bloomer. Um, just because all throughout college and uni, I was pretty much invisible. I didn't really, I just kind of kept my head down and kept to work and wasn't really that sociable. So I think after I graduated was when I kind of dipped a toe in 
in the field of dating. And at that time, it was predominantly like online dating. And it was just very tragic. <laughs> it was just, it was just, it was horrible. I'm not going to lie. Like the online dating world is brutal. It's a jungle out there. Like yeah. it, it's from being fetishized to people just saying really horrible things. You know, one of the positives is, it, is that I did meet my first boyfriend on like one of those sites. But like even after that relationship, navigating dating was just really weird and horrible because I always felt like I had to put disclaimers on websites like, oh, by the way, I'm fat or like, oh, by the way, or not by the way, I'm dark skin because I could see it. But mm. in terms of like weight stuff, even though I made myself very visible with regards to putting, you know, full length photos and things like that, there were times where I would meet up with someone and they would be like, oh, you're a lot bigger in real life. Like they would say it to me uh and I'm like, but you knew this and like the run up to us meeting I kept having to remind you oh by the way I'm fat like and it's so annoying that we sometimes feel like we have to make our way a disclaimer mm -hmm. and so yeah just a lot of like fetishizing things no I, I've seen like videos or like TikToks of like plus people saying that's their experience with dating like having to really be meticulous with the pictures they put up and make sure they look quote unquote as big as they actually are because mm -hmm. they can't bother with turning up to the day and being rejected because of that. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I've also seen the, the stories of that flying around, which I can imagine can't, yeah. can't be very nice at all. But it's a weird one as well, because again, it's like even being plus size, it's so tied into like this concept of having to perform femininity mm. as well, because it's like, being seen as plus size from the outside, some people already feel it's quite a masculine thing to be. And so it's like, okay, I'm gonna take a picture and look as big as I am in real life, but then also I have to like hold myself in a specific way so that I look like I've got an hourglass figure or I don't wanna look like I'm too big on top or I don't wanna look like I'm too intimidating or too um, masculine looking sometimes. And it's a really weird kind of thing to navigate. And that's only hearing feedback from other guys that I've, like stupid feedback, obviously, from guys <laughs> that I've gone on, on dates with who liken being dark skinned and being plus size to being masculine. Yeah. And being dark skinned, we all know that, unfortunately, there are these stereotypes that the darker you are, the more aggressive you are, mm -hmm. the more further away from femininity you are. It's such a mind game like trying to navigate that and just show up as your best self when everyone is putting all of these stereotypes and things on you and causing you to sometimes doubt your own sense of self-worth you kind of battle against that with a lot of some of the dating scope which is just annoying yeah i want to touch on the figure thing because yeah. i've had plenty of conversations where i've picked up on the fact that the argument for, you know, inclusivity getting better is like all shapes and sizes when actually, <laughs> well, first of all, the sizes is, it's not giving. Like the sizes the are size still stopping at the smaller end. Yeah. But no one talks about shapes. Yeah. And I feel like that's heavily tied into desirability politics. And that's Absolutely. something that I had struggled with because not to be all worries me because I'm not actually like, I don't, I'm not seen in the world as plus size. And I understand the privilege with that. But the shape thing, along with the masculinity of being dark skin, along with having a shaved head, is something that I've found, even to this day, I still struggle with because mm -hmm. I feel like desirability politics are heavily tied to a certain shape. And when you don't have that shape on top of other things, mm -hmm. I just wanna know how you find navigating self-love when you know that that is an added thing in desirability politics that is working against you. I hate it because not everybody has hips, you know? Not, not everybody, everybody has hips. Not everyone has hips, not everyone has a bum, not everyone has that extreme hourglass figure. And like when you're black as well, I think there's an automatic expectation that you right. have to have that body type. Stereotypically, or maybe just within our phenotype, we're more naturally aligned to have that figure, but not everybody has that figure mm. and I think sometimes we get demonized for not being an, an extreme hourglass shape. And it's long because it's just like, what do you want me to do? When I was in uni and I wrote this in my book, I bought butt pads because they were all the rage. I don't, I don't care, I'll, I'll embarrass myself. I really don't <laughs> it's care. It's embarrassing. Because I thought, oh, you know, this is like a thing that everyone seems to be doing around that time. It was like 2008 and I got them off of Amazon and I remember going to a nightclub with some uni friends and I was like dancing a little bit too enthusiastically and one flew out. <laughs> oh 
And oh you know when like you watch a comedy movie and something happens and the music just stops? It's just like, Rip! that's what I felt oh in my God. head. And everyone just stared at the floor. And I oh just slinked, my God. I slinked out through the crowd. I was like, I can't. No, I literally have tears in my eyes. I actually can't remember that story. I was like, how is this my life? Like, and it's like it happened in slow motion. And I was like, actually, do you know what? This is actually ridiculous. What am I doing? Like, yeah, I'm doing all of this for what reason? Yeah. And it was just, that was, that was at the time it was like, kind of spoke to how much I wanted to have that kind of desirable body shape because being, again, like even in the plus size sphere, it's like there's the whole concept of being an acceptable fat. Mm -hmm. And an acceptable fat normally is somebody that has got an extreme hourglass shape or small waist, wide hips, big bum, big boobs kind of thing, flat-ish stomach. Right. And that is what society kind of deems as acceptable when it comes to being chubby or when it comes to being plus size and anything outside of that is deemed as, oh, that's not desirable. And that's something that we see a lot when it comes to like lookbooks for fashion mm -hmm. or models and things like that, where it's like they claim to be inclusive and diverse and for all bodies. But then when we look at the body types on show, you're still subscribing to the sexualized sort of right. curvy shape as opposed to just having curvy bodies of all shapes and sizes. It's still tied to that patriarchal concept of curves meaning sexy and all of that kind of stuff. And so it's still kind of, it's annoying that we're still associating that and trying to live up to a patriarchal standard and patriarchal eye when it comes to how we see ourselves. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, being plus size and, and black and, you know, being expected to have a certain body shape and not having it really did make me feel like I was like, am I less black? And like that coupled with sort of where I grew up and the way I spoke and stuff, it really gave me a bit of an identity crisis at some point because I was like, I don't feel like I'm black enough to be in this group of friends or that group of friends. And yeah, it, it did give me, it did make me feel a bit weird when I, yeah, when I was a teenager, like mm. I didn't really know where to kind of fit in. I wanna pick up on a word that you said, which is a word that my therapist pointed out makes me physically uncomfortable. Oh, okay. And it's sexy. Mm. I, yeah, I don't really like that word either. I don't know what it is, but that word just makes me, I can't even just say it without my whole like, every, my whole physical just goes weird. And I feel like it's because of my experiences with desirability politics. And I speak about this with Sky, my fiance, all the time. Growing up and not having external validation from men, even if it's like catcalling or like, you know, all that kind of stuff that obviously people hate because it's non-consensual or just like men sliding into your DMs or sending a dick pic or whatever the fuck. At the end of the day, that is all at least some form of validation. When you don't have that yeah. and you've been invisible yeah. for so long and you felt invisible for so long, yeah. it's almost as detrimental or more. And I don't want to sound like ungrateful for having not been like sexually assaulted a lot of the times or like I feel what you're saying but, I felt like that as well right and I feel like this is like this is a common thing but we don't talk about it because it's the wrong thing to say when there are so many people suffering from those kind of acts but at the same time not having that external validation mm -hmm. has had an effect on me as a grown adult in feeling validated and, des and feeling desirable, feeling sexy, believing someone when they say that they're attracted to you or that they find you this, that, or th do you, you feel? I feel exactly what you're saying. Like sometimes when I would have like really attractive friends being like, oh, this guy keeps bothering me. I was just like, I wish someone would bother me. Right. Like, it's like, like, I wouldn't be bothered. Do you know what I mean? Like, I wouldn't be bothered. I want someone to slide into my DMs. Like I, do you know, and I completely get it because yeah, being made to feel invisible your whole life can be detrimental. It makes you question your self-worth. It makes you feel like, wow, does everybody think that I'm just this gross creature just walking around the earth? Right. <laughs> like, it, it is really horrible. Like you said, it's it's difficult to talk about because it's like you don't want to seem as if you're um, supporting, you know, catcalling or things like that. And as much as we demonize, you know, needing external validation, because ultimately we don't. But sometimes a little is nice. We do. <laughs> yeah. I just think anyone who says they don't need external validation is lying. No, lying. Go through your life without any validation on how desirable you are and see 
see how it feels. Like, I just think, obviously, like, there's a happy medium. People would probably be like, there's a happy medium. I'd prefer to be only approached by attractive guys. But it's like, okay, but at least you have the option. You have 50% attractive, 50% not attractive. Mm. At least you're being, you know, like, people are seeing you. Try literally being invisible. Yeah. And navigating that. They're navigating dating. They're navigating... You know, just like feeling yourself. And that's why I think I struggle with the word sexy. Yeah. Because I feel like people sort of go through their journey of, I don't know, their sexuality journey like starts in like secondary school mm. and getting all of these like feelings and stuff. But when you're just invisible and it hasn't started from then, yeah. when is it supposed to start? Because then you get to an age where you're supposed to already know how you feel about yourself and like yeah. people only want someone who is confident or like someone who is comfortable in their sexuality but it's like I don't really have a chance to I don't I to feel do like a late, I, yes it's like you don't it's like there was a point where it's like okay you're supposed to be at that point now so if you start doing it then it's a bit cringe but it's like but, right so yeah I don't like I don't I don't like using that word either because I just feel like no, that's not really me I'm more just like you know cute or like goofy or whatever it's it's still like a your mind is trying to play catch up with your body almost right. and because you haven't gone through those experiences as a teenager and you've been made to feel invisible it's like the things that people experience as teenagers and young adults we're only experiencing now in our mid to late 20s early 30s so right. we have a lot of catching up to do when it comes to leaning more heavily into our sexuality and what makes us feel good and what how we feel in ourselves and our bodies and these are things that a lot of people did because they had that validation and those experiences as like 13 14 15 mm -hmm. a lot of us well i feel like some of us are doing it now in like our late 20s early 30s and so there's a weird kind of yeah, there's a weird kind of disconnect there, not being able to really figure out what it means to be sexy or what it means to be attractive. And I understand when people kind of say things like, oh, but it sounds like you're complaining about not doing this, but it, it actually does, like you say, like having that validation, it actually does help. It can yeah. help with your self-esteem. The issue is when people lean too much on it and rely on yeah. nothing but external validation to prove themselves. But having a little bit here and there can help because it sh it shows that people see you, like they see you and they appreciate you for what you are or what you look like and that kind of thing. Like it always helps. I definitely agree. I'm glad you got it. Cause I really yeah, 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 definitely. I didn't want to say it and then you're just like, yeah. That, I definitely <laughs> felt like, like that that way as well. It's just like, yeah, sometimes I want someone to say that I look nice to you. you know? Right. Okay. So let's uh, pivot. Uh-huh. I want to talk about your soft launch. Yes. For your man. <laughs> um, I want to let you explain the situation because basically it took a turn. Uh, you <laughs> soft launching <laughs> that you were in a relationship. Mm resorted in bizarre negativity from some of your followers yes so with so i got into a relationship in january mm -hmm. and i always said like in the very rare event that i was ever in a relationship i would never show anything i would never show his face i would never show anything like that and to a degree i kind of sort of kept that but i kind of like perhaps have a picture of us like maybe once every couple of months or so. But in that moment, I think because I was so, the, the whole situation was so new to me. It was very, I was very happy. I was very much like, oh man, like all this time, you know, on my blogs and things like that, I'm always talking about the pitfalls of dating and how trash it can be when you're plus size and stuff. And, you know, I never thought that I would ever, ever get into a relationship. And I think, you know, before kind of getting into a relationship with him, I had already, cut myself off of the thought of ever being in a relationship. Like I was thinking about freezing my eggs. I was like, I'm just gonna do life on my own. And if I want kids, I'm just gonna do it on my own. Like I was making steps to just doing that. And then that just came out of nowhere. And it was all very sweet and romantic and stuff. And so I think at the time that I posted the initial post, I was like really happy and just really in love. And you know, it was all fresh and new. So I posted, <laughs> I posted the, the image and then like a cute little caption or whatever. And to be fair, people were really lovely. So I got like really nice messages and things. But then halfway, like throughout the day, I started noticing, and I think in total, I received like 13 DMs. So I only showed one DM of the 13 from 
my followers who basically the outline of the messages were, I'm going to unfollow you now because I don't feel like I can connect with you anymore. Basically because I had a boyfriend, they didn't feel like they could tap into my misery or my frustration with being single and plus size. And they said that they, could, they couldn't relate to me because I was in a relationship. So they decided to very kindly, you know, slide into my DMs to announce their departure. And it's not, an um, airport, babes. it's not an airport. It really isn't like I, you don't need to, to tell me that. And um, yeah. And I was just like, wow, this is really strange. I found the whole situation really bizarre because it just felt like, okay, so these followers, were you only interested in my content when I was upset or when I was down or when I was depressed or talking about how terrible it is it's almost felt like they were just leeching off of my pain and the minute that I you know presented myself in a situation where I was happy it was like they could no longer kind of use that as a way to make them feel themselves feel more superior than me because the race of all of the women that uh, contacted me were all the same which I thought was also very interesting mm. considering the work that I do regarding you know talking about confidence and self-love and self-esteem and you know how that intersects with being black. And, you know, since the whole George Floyd incident where a lot of us online started doing a lot more, a lot more advocacy or we got bigger audiences. And so it became a thing where people were trying to learn from us. And it got to a point where it was like, I was starting to feel like somebody's mammy. I was starting to feel like I'm just here giving you free advice. Like I'm literally, teaching people how to not be racist all the time. It was for like three or four months after that happened with like the Black Lives Matter thing. It just felt like myself and a lot of other create like black creators were forced into these roles where we had to constantly provide emotional advice and support to people who just didn't understand why they couldn't say the N word or couldn't say this or why they, why it was okay to have all white press events and things like that. So there was a lot of emotional, trauma that a lot of us were carrying. And so some of those women who DM'd me when I would scroll up the messages were the same ones asking me, you know, to dedicate my time to telling them why being racist was not the right thing. Please. And um, yeah, I just found it, it was just, it was interesting. It was interesting to me. Do you feel like that situation is playing a part in why us as dark skinned black women feel the way that we do in terms of dating and desirability and joy within within ourselves and, and being in a happy relationship. Do you feel like that was encouraging that that's not our place and that our place is is to be, you know, like- Struggling. Born. Yeah, struggling, yes. trauma born and like just educational and yeah. all those kind of things. Cause I even made a post that was like consume more black joy because I yeah. felt like. We're not emotional support animals. Right. And that's what I feel like sometimes we're treated as. Right. What I found interesting, what came into play, I found a bit more was the colorism aspect. Mm. I think if my partner was dark skinned, I probably wouldn't have gotten as much engagement or as much um, maybe comments because he's mixed race there was an element of, oh my gosh, Steph, he's so attractive. How did you get him? How did you get him? Gosh, you must be so like you. And I remember one particular follower of mine who's always been a little bit too comfortable with stuff because I don't know her from Adam, but she was like, oh, you must feel so like good about yourself that you're with a, a light skinned Michael Ely looking like, and I'm just like, first of all, he doesn't look like Michael Ely. Don't tell him that because it will just, <laughs> his head will just explode. <laughs> but like, I was like, what, what is that? You think that my sense of ego and self-esteem would be inflated because I'm with someone that's mixed race? Like that was wild to me. Um, so I do think that there is not only like the plus, not only us being dark skinned, but when you are with somebody that is of a lighter skin tone, there sometimes those questions of how did you get with her? Or, oh, they're so attractive. Like you must be so happy to be with someone that looks like that. Mm. I'm just like, so am I not worthy enough to be with like, Mm. Yeah, to me, it was very funny. I do feel like well, what you've just said, like when you're with someone who is lighter, that there's the questions of like, you should be so this, that and the other, or like they're really, I feel like because of my personal experiences, I put that on myself. 
as well. Because mm. I feel like that's something even that I've been going through in my current relationship in like feeling like I'm punching because mm. she's more desirable. And that's obviously because of like how I feel about myself, but also how situations are. If we're out and about, the guys are hollering at her or like she's getting moved to, or like celebrities are sliding into her DMs trying to be like, you're an 11 out of 10. Yeah. And I'm just here like- It's like even bread, though, like- Yeah, but it's like- <laughs> It's so annoying. It's so annoying. I'm just saying, it's annoying, yeah. Because it's like, I don't want that interaction to go, for it to go anywhere because I'm, I'm with her. So it's not like, I want people to slide into my DMs so that I can get with them. No, it's just like, it just feels like a reinforced, idea that I am less. Less than. Yeah, and it's so weird to be in the position where I've literally found the love of my life. I know she only wants to be with me. I only want to be with her, but it still hurts. Why do you sound like me it right still now? Hurts. You sound like me. It's I'm exactly the, you know, yeah. I'm exactly the same. Cause I found myself sometimes like, I don't feel like I'm good enough or I don't feel like, like, why are you with me? Why are you not with like another light skinned girl kind of thing? Cause we've, there've been situations where me and him have gone out and he gets chatted up all the time. Or, you know, I've had people ask, ask me for his Instagram so that they can follow him. I said, no, what, like, are you mad kind of thing? And so there is, you know, he is being mixed race. He has the desirability kind of element there for him. And there has been times when I have spoken to him about it, like why, why are you with me? Like, I don't, I, I, for the longest time, I kept trying to push him away because I just didn't think that I was worth it. Mm. And he caught onto that very early and he's been trying, still to this day, trying to like reassure me and let me know like, like I'm the only one that he wants. But when you've been brainwashed or like, you know, when you spent your whole life thinking that you're not worthy of love or desire or respect because of how you look. When somebody that is very conventionally attractive comes into your life and they're like, I want you. Like your first response is why? Why do you mm. want me? Like mm. everybody else has kept drumming into me my whole life that I'm not the one that they want because of how I look. So why is it that you as somebody that is conventionally attractive, why are you choosing me? Like, is it a joke? Is it a fetish? Is it this? Is it that? Mm. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, I even convinced, I even said to him at one point, I think you've got a fetish for dark skin girls. <laughs> and he was like, you're just pulling things out of your ass now. That's not the case. Like, I just like you. For yeah, because if he didn't, then we'd be like, you're a colorist. So. Yeah, exactly. And I just started trying to come up with every excuse as to why his like for me was fake. And I realized that was my self-esteem and my self-worth, like trying to tell me the best story that would make sense in my head. Because I couldn't and sometimes still can't make sense of why mm. he likes me or why he's like um, attracted to me kind of thing. Like with you and Sky, like it, it reinforces when, like, when we go out or when we're amongst people and people pay more attention to him. And it's just mm. like, oh, so I'm just sitting here like bread, like. It's also triggering. Cause it's like, I mean, being in a relationship with a woman who is being the one that's being like hit on is triggering because it's like when I used to go out with my friends mm. and like, I would just be like, it's like I had the invisibility cloak on. Like, mm. it's just like I wasn't there because it, but it feels worse because like, that's my woman. That's your, yeah. <laughs> you're like stepping up and you're gonna, you're just gonna move to her in front of me. And what can I do? Because first of all, I'm also a woman and you're a guy. So mm. I don't want to get punched in the face, but mm. also like, that's my woman. And like, I don't know, it's- uh, It's wild. It's, there's a lot going on. There's a lot of layers there, yeah, yeah. it's wild. Yeah. Okay, so I have a question I want to ask you. Mm -hmm. What is one apology that you've made in the past that you want to take back? Oh, one apology. The one apology that I can think of was in 2000, um, I want to say 2019. <sighs> 2019 and I've spoken about this story at length but I I guess I left this little bit out because I didn't want to come across as more pathetic <laughs> than I was made to be in the in the actual like story but it was when I went out with someone and then I found out that they had gone out with me for a dare kind of thing and I was emailed that information by the person's friend and I actually did email back like apologizing for like, oh, I'm sorry that I wasn't the right type 
for him kind of thing. I was cussing the guy out in the email, but then at the end, I was like, it's just really frustrating that this person has used me for this. And, you know, you you guys made a bet to see who could sleep with like the, the, the fattest girl, basically. And that ended up to be me. And I apologized for looking the way that I did. And I shouldn't have, but I think I was so low at that time after receiving that information that I automatically apologized on behalf or apologized for looking the way that I looked. Mm -hmm. And I wish that, I wish that I hadn't had put that there. I should have just kept it to the cousin. But yeah, I that's something that I do really regret because at the end of the day in that situation, that guy was the one in the wrong. Like, mm. And it took me a long time to not blame myself for all of the terrible or all of the bad or traumatic things that have happened that have been as a result of dating. Mm. A lot of the time I will tend to internalize it and blame me. Like if I didn't look this way, then I wouldn't have half of the things happen to me. And that I think is, for me is an interesting, perhaps trauma response. Cause I remember when the first time that I ever decided to tell my parents that I was getting bullied at school. And I, I did it when I was 15 and I had to, because when I came home, I was like, I had be gotten beaten up. So I came home looking just, there's blood everywhere. It was just really terrible. And like my, my dad asked me, you know, what what's happened. And so I told him. And the first thing that he said was, well, maybe if you weren't so fat, you wouldn't get, you wouldn't have gotten bullied. And that is something wow. I will always remember for the rest of my life. And that was what kind of triggered the, the sense of blame. So every time something bad happened to me, even though it was the other person's fault, I would automatically blame myself and then apologize for looking the way that I do. Like it's an imposition to the other person. So with that situation in 2019 with the guy that, you know, was paid to sleep with me or whatever, which is a weird kind of really weird situation. I apologized and now I, yeah. Now I really wish I could take that back. I remember th that I think there was, an article or oh, yeah, maybe I it was your blog post. No, I wrote an article because he got paid. So I was like, okay, if you're gonna get paid for, by your friends, I'm going to get paid by writing about it as that's well. We'll both exploit you. the situation. Yeah, no, that, hell. <laughs> that's how I found your page. And I was just, I couldn't even believe that that was a real story. And yeah. I, I'm just sorry that that happened to you. And that, yeah, that it's a, a trauma response to you is to apologize. But I hope this is a chance to reclaim yeah, that definitely. apology and just take it back and be like, no, actually, fuck you. Like, I don't need to apologize for, Absolutely. for the way that I look because I am just unapologetically here. Mm -hmm. This is who I am. Absolutely, we move, and we move. I am desirable. Yeah, I maybe mean, I'm still trying you. to work on that. I'm still trying to like, it's, oh, it's, same. <laughs> it's interesting because when you have that kind of position of advocacy, you're always trying to encourage others to yeah. live their best lives. But then sometimes it's like, you'll have those moments where it's like, actually, I don't feel like I'm that desirable or I don't feel yeah. like I'm that. But in the landscape that we're in with like body positivity and stuff and like toxic positivity, it's like, you can't let your gut, guard down sometimes or you, yeah. you can't say that actually I'm having a really shit day today mm -hmm. because then people will jump on you or they'll be like oh so you're not body positive anymore and it's like I am but body positivity or what what it was supposed to be is to acknowledge that you are going to have good days and you are going to have bad days and mm. that's okay like you don't have to be positive about yourself every single time because then it puts a lot of pressure on ourselves to have to be positive and happy and jolly when sometimes because we are humans that exist and are sociable and sometimes we can see things that trigger us there are going to be days where we might just be like oh I just you know, feel a bit like shit today. But I think as long as you can acknowledge that you're feeling that and just say, Do you know what, tomorrow will be a better day or mm. in three days time, I'll have a better day. I'm just gonna feel how I'm feeling and just know that it is not a part of my story right mm -hmm. now. So as long as you can, you can acknowledge and process that and just know that this is not your permanent state of thinking, then it's fine to have those emotions because we're all we're all human. But yeah. yeah, sometimes it's like I'll say, oh, you know, we're all desirable, we're all this. And then there'll be a day where I wake up and I'm like, ugh, I just want to go back to bed. I don't feel it's tiring. Desirable. Like it's I tiring. just think also it's not a reflection on you not believing in what you say anymore. It's just being tired mm -hmm. on the situation that is at hand. Cause mm -hmm. it's like the same thing with being black. Like I wouldn't change being black. I wouldn't change being dark skinned for the world. Sometimes I'm just tired of the way that I get treated because of it. That's and it's it. the same thing with like, yeah, everything else. It's like, it's not necessarily, it's not my issue, it's your issue that's pissing me off. Like yes. the fact that it's your issue. Exactly. So.
Yes. Well, thank you so much for having this chat with me, babe. Thank I you. really, really appreciate it. And I'm so glad that we've finally been able to do it. Is there anything that you want to plug whilst you're here? First of all, thank you so much for having me. Like, I feel like this is a conversation that we could just uh, over wine, just keep going and going because right. go, there's so many more levels to discuss. But no, thank you so much for having me on. And um, to plug just my just me on Instagram, I guess. So my Instagram is at Stephanie Yaboa. And that's the name of my blog page as well. And then I have, oh, I can plug a podcast, I guess. Yeah. I've got a podcast now that's coming out on the 21st of September called Storytime with Stephanie. And yeah, that's it. Amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of Say It With Your Chest. If you're loving the conversations that we're having, make sure to rate us five stars and to leave a review wherever you're watching or listening right now. Make sure to follow, like and subscribe to all things Say It With Your Chest and make sure you follow Girls Who Are Boys on Instagram and TikTok to know when the next episode will drop. See you next time.